Well, hi, everybody. How are you? I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I haven't been given an official signal to start, but it's 11.30, so I figure we just jump right in. Um, welcome. I'm very glad and uh, grateful to be back here to be able to talk about this uh, topic. It's a fascinating area of law. It's an ever-changing area of law. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of a squishy area of law, but that's what keeps people like me employed, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> I, I want to give you um, a little bit of an introduction about myself so you can, uh, and it really, it's not, a, it's not a global introduction that's in my bio, which is in the, the pamphlets, but it's a little bit more personal. I grew up in a little town in New Mexico uh, that was probably, if I had to guess, about 95% Catholic. My family was not Catholic. We actually didn't really have much religion. Uh, my dad was kind of a lapsed Catholic, would go occasionally. My mom uh, really, I think, believed in God, but had no real affiliation with religion. Um, in fact, I think she was then and continues to be today kind of not really into organized religion. So I grew up with kind of a vague sense that there might be a higher power, but no real religion in my life. Um, when I went through my younger years, none of that really changed. And then I got to be in high school, and I started really searching and exploring a lot of different religions. And I, was, I would spend my evening, no one knew of this, you know, I'm the tall guy, uh, and so I played basketball. And everyone just thought I was kind of a dumb jock, which is fair. <laughs> and then I went, in the evenings though, and I would read religious texts from a variety of different faiths, studying about different religions. Well, one day, I'm in the school library, and this girl asks me if I'd be interested in coming to church with her. And we start talking, and she starts telling me more and more about her church, and I, I go to church with her, and as the weeks go on, she gives me religious scriptures from her church, and I study those, and we talk about them at school. And then other people come, other students come, and they say, well, you shouldn't listen to her, you know, they're, they're crazy, don't listen to their religion, here's some other stuff, and they handed me things, and I studied what they gave me. And there was this great dialogue going on at my school. And that's how I ended up being of the faith that I am today. So let me set that story aside, though, because it ties directly into what we're going to study today. What are the rights of religious and non-religious students in schools? What are the rights of their parents? What are they allowed to do? What are they allowed to talk about and not talk about? In what settings? That's what we're going to explore. And I'll circle back to my story at the very end. But what I'd like to jump into first is, is my goal today, which is I want to talk about broad principles. I was just on the phone 10 minutes ago with a buddy of mine who is the general counsel for a large school district, uh, which means he's kind of the head lawyer for that school district. And there are, I don't, think I'm using, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I tell you there are thousands of scenarios that can come up where religion and law intersect and they have to figure out how to navigate them properly. So we could get very easily just lost in the minutia dealing with these little tiny things. What I want to talk about today are very broad principles that we can then Hopefully, you can go back to your communities and apply them. And when you see scenarios, you'll be able to apply these principles to those scenarios. First off, um, the first really broad principle I want to talk about is this idea that religious freedom, it really is a great gift to the world. This is different. This is a cartoon that suggests religion is the cause of war, right? And there's a lot of people who feel that way, and, and you can see how they would get there. In reality, it's not so much religion that leads to warfare as it is a lack of religious freedom that leads to warfare. Religious freedom, by and large, in the United States and the Western world has eradicated religious warfare. In the United States especially, which is one of the most religiously diverse countries in the history of the world, you don't see any of this type of religious warfare. Sure, we have our fighting and our bickering and going back and forth, but we have developed a system to allow us to avoid the horrors of the past. This is an image from the 30, year, 30 Years' War in Germany, which was, it was more than just a religious war, but it was in very many respects a religious war. Over 20% of Germany's population was killed in this war. Um, so the first principle is religious freedom matters. It's not just religion. My view of this from a scholarly standpoint and as a lawyer who practices in this area is that everybody has religion. Even people who claim that they don't have a religion they have answers to religious questions, right? They have, those answers may be, well, we're just gonna die and that's the end. It may be more agnostic where they say, well, 
I don't really know one way or the other, but those are still religious answers. So we all have religion to some level. So it's not religion that leads to war, it's a lack of religious liberty. And that matters a great deal when you're talking about how you should ha what the rights of students should be in school. So that's one broad principle I want to talk about, the importance of religious liberty. Second, I want to give you a little history of public schools in the United States. Um, when, public, when schooling first started in the United States, they were almost all run through churches. And churches held, had schoolhouses and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, when you started to have state-funded schools, they were largely Protestant. Um, and they would allow things like Protestant reading of the Bible in school. Well, that became a problem as more and more Catholics started to immigrate across from Europe. And this image is from the late 1800s. If you look really closely at it, this is a Protestant school teacher protecting all of the Protestant American children from what are Catholic bishops coming out of the water. If you look carefully, I mean, this is a highly offensive cartoon. I want to be very clear about that, okay? But this was, this was the dynamic in the late 19th century of how people viewed public schools. Public schools were supposed to be a, a, a bastion to protect Protestants against this invasion of Catholic immigrants coming from Ireland and other countries. So if you look here, these are Catholic bishops whose hats have been manipulated to look you know, like alligator mouths or some kind of horrible monsters coming out to, to, to take the American children away. So you had, you had these schools designed to prevent that, which is why a large majority of the private schools you see in the, United, in the United States tend to be Catholic. The Catholics couldn't get in the public schools what they wanted, so they started forming private schools. Okay? Now eventually, religious liberty ended this kind of stuff. I mean, this is a very mean, hateful picture. And religious liberty is what ended this. So I just want to give you a little history of this so you understand it. Now we're going to move on to some, some just broad principles that relate to religious liberty more broadly. And then we'll focus in on how they affect students in schools. This is a, a portion of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. And as I started to get into the law, let me interrupt myself and just say, uh, this is going to be a very interactive session once I get into it a little bit. And I'm going to be asking you guys to give me ideas. But as I get going on something, if you have a question or you have a thought, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. And, and it should, you should not hesitate at all to interrupt me. It doesn't bother me at all, especially if you have follow-up questions on anything. So there are two clauses in the First Amendment that really relate to the rights of students in schools. The first is what's called the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That is the language where we get this idea of separation of church and state. That Congress, and now that's been meant to apply basically to all governments, government shall not establish a religion. Okay, that's what that means. The next clause in the First Amendment is Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. So that one means government can't come along and prevent us from you know, believing the way we want to believe, practicing our religion the way we want to practice our religion. Those two clauses are crucial to religious freedom in the United States. Both, both clauses support religious freedom. And you can't have religious freedom without both the principles that are derived from both of those clauses. So I, I hope this, you know, I'm not the most technically savvy guy in the world. I was an English major. But I hope my little uh, diagram here shows that if you get rid of either the principles from either clause, the Establishment Clause or the Free Exercise Clause, religious freedom tumbles. And I'll explain why a little bit more. This is true in all contexts, but it's especially true when it, in schools where you're dealing with children whose minds are still malleable and, and they're young and they can be persuaded. Uh, both of these clauses really, really matter. So that's um, the second general principle there is understanding the, the two components to religious freedom, the Establishment Clause component and the Free Exercise Clause. In schools specifically, the free exercise clause means that public schools should not burden a student's religious exercise, except in rare circumstances. So religious exercise, you need to think of that as being broadly defined. And, and what I'd like to do, if I could, to keep you kind of actively learning here, is um, if everyone would think in your head, what are different ways students might practice their religion? Uh, I don't, I'm not going to ask for hands now, but have that question churning in your subconscious. And in a little while, we're going to talk about it more specifically, and I'm going to ask you guys to share me your thoughts. But just ask yourself right now, what are the different ways that students 
might want to practice their religions in, religion in school, okay? And, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. So that's, that's the free exercise in practice, the free exercise clause in practice. The no establishment principles in practice are public schools should not promote or favor one religion or non-religion over another. Kind of, as you're looking at a various, a various scenarios when you go back to your communities and you see school boards doing things or teachers making decisions, you can apply this principle and ask, are they favoring one church over another? Are they favoring one religion over another? Are they favoring non-religion over religion? Are they favoring religion over non-religion? Okay. Understanding that non-religion in many respects really is just another form of religious belief. So you have to treat it the same way. Okay, you would treat atheism and agnosticism the same way you would Christianity or Islam. You'll note here I say except in rare circumstances. There are, the, the law allows schools to burden someone's exercise of their religion if the schools can show that they have a compelling interest and that they are picking a very narrow way to get at that compelling interest. So um, let me give you an example. Let's say you have a student who says, every day at 10.15, I have to kneel down wherever I am and say a loud vocal prayer. It's part of my religion, I have to do it. School says, well, you are literally in the middle of your geography class then. You can't just get on your knees and start praying. It would disrupt the class, you wouldn't be able to do anything, none of the other students would be able to learn, it'd be a horrible problem. That's probably a compelling interest. I think it's fair to say a school has an interest in in allowing its teachers to teach without, and, and students to learn without someone's religious beliefs completely interrupting what's going on. So they have a compelling interest. The question then is, what's the narrowly tailored way they can get at that? And generally what happens in those scenarios is a school would say, look, we're going to burden your religion so much that you can't just get up in the middle of class and start, get on your knees and start belting out a really loud prayer. But we will let you leave class five minutes early, go to a private room, do what you got to do at 10.15, and then come back, right? So schools can accommodate a person's religious beliefs. They're still burdening it a little bit in that the student has to kind of go out of his or her way to go where they need to go to pray. So the school is burdening religion, but they're doing it in a way where they're trying to accommodate everybody, and that's largely where the law shakes out. But that's an example of those rare circumstances where a school might be able to uh, burden someone's religious liberty. We'll get back into this just a little bit, uh, a little bit in more depth with some examples in, in, in a few more slides. So, another broad principle to apply and to always remember is that st students do not shed their constitutional rights when they walk into the schoolhouse doors, okay? You don't have to pretend suddenly that you are no longer a Christian or a Mormon or Muslim just because you happen to walk into the school. You're allowed to engage in your constitutional rights within limits, and we'll talk about those limits. Free exercise. So I wanna get now into specifics of how schools might burden free exercise in scenarios that might come up. You'll see here that there are all sorts of things students are allowed to do in schools. They're allowed to pray in schools. They're allowed to wear their religious garb in schools as long as it's not disrupting others and causing problems. And, and those are vague terms. Right? If I say, well, you can wear your religious garb as long as it's not disruptive, we have to define disruptive. 99% of the time, it's not a problem. Okay, a Muslim girl can wear her hijab and, and it's not going to disrupt anything in the school. Yes? So I'll repeat the question so we pick it up. So what if there is a school policy that everyone has to wear uniforms? And you're saying a religious person comes and says, well, can I... I need to wear something else that's not in line with the uniform, right? The school would have to be, would be obligated under the law to try to accommodate that student's request. And if they can't, they need to be able to prove that they have a compelling interest for why they can't accommodate it, okay? I'm trying to think of a scenario, and I'm making this up on the fly, so it might not be a very good one, but let's say you have some religious garment that looks exactly like gang colors in your community, and if you wear it to school, it's going to cause an all-out brawl. You could see a school making that argument. It seems far-fetched to me, but you could see them trying to make that kind of argument. Other than that, though, they need to try to accommodate the, the student's religious request. Does that make sense? And so as parents and your children, as they go in uh, as students, should feel confident telling the school, even if there's uniforms, that this is my religious tradition, this is my faith, and, and I need to be able to do this, and you shouldn't be able to burden me. Most schools are going to understand that and they're going to go along with it because they don't want to be sued. 
right? But that is your right to make that request. Another one, another right that students have is to gather together in groups and say prayers. So you see this a lot in the evangelical Christian community. Um, students will get together at the flagpole in the morning before schools and, and gather together and they'll say a group prayer. They are allowed to do that. They are allowed to gather together as a group and say a prayer. They are allowed to invite other people to join them. Um, they are allowed to, to say those prayers out loud. Now, I, this is just a couple of examples. I asked you a little bit ago to think about what are some examples of ways students might exercise their religion. We heard one, maybe wanting to wear clothes in violation of a school code, but what else? What are other ways people want to live their religion? So I'm going to give you a very truncated answer to that uh, for two reasons. One, we're going to touch on it in a little bit, but also there's actually a separate class about teacher responsibilities and rights that you can go to, and I don't want to step on their toes. It's a tricky question, unfortunately. Teachers have the absolute right also to engage in their religious practices, but they have to be very careful that they don't give the appearance that they are or the school is endorsing what is happening at the flagpole. Um, I'm going to leave it there for now, that, the idea of endorsement. And in a little bit, uh, we'll talk about it some more. I'll come back to it. And then I've got a, I actually have a video clip that ties into exactly your question. But if by the end I haven't answered it, come up and talk to me and we'll keep doing it. What other ways would students engage in free exercise? <laughs> were you were you praying just on your own? So that is an excellent example. Students are absolutely entitled under the law to pray in school, okay? They are allowed to, they do it all the time. They pray over their tests. They pray over their food before they eat, right? Sometimes they're just having a hard time. I mean, no one's more dramatic and emotional than a teenager. They feel like everything is a hard time, right? They need to pray. And, and, and so those who are religious will, will pray and they're allowed to do that. And so it's not illegal and, and students need to understand that they have that right. And there are limits and boundaries on it, and I'll get to that in a minute. But right now, if a student wants to pray on their own, it's completely allowed under the law. Yes? <clears throat> One that I've had, uh, I'm a seminary institute teacher for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So a common one that's happened for me is a student coming and saying, what am I supposed to do? We're going to watch this uh, movie in the class, or it's been assigned for homework. And it's not something that I feel I should watch. So they... So my next slide hits that. The rest of you are not off the hook. I'm going to go back to my free exercise slide and get some more examples of free exercise. But let's move to this since you brought it up, OK? I'm going to give you an example. It's exactly what this gentleman said, Mr. Featherstone. Um, he talked about somebody saying, well, I don't want to watch a movie. It violates my religious beliefs. I put Schindler's List up here for a reason. I had a family come to me once, and the teacher was going to be teaching about the Holocaust to a high school class and was going to show Schindler's List. The mom of the student didn't want her son watching Schindler's List. And so she told the teacher that. She said, according to my religious tradition, I mean, I'm going to say this more like a lawyer, but you, know, you can see a mom coming in and making these arguments. She says, look, according to my religious tradition, if my son watches this movie, it's going to put images and ideas in his head that will, that will prevent him from being able to communicate with a higher power. I don't want him watching this movie. It's going to put lasting images in his head that he won't be able to get out, and I don't want it there. And the teacher pushed back and said, well, your son, though, needs to understand the Holocaust and the horrors of World War II and all this stuff. And she said, look, she said, look, I don't disagree. I think my son should learn about the Holocaust. He should learn what led up to the Holocaust, what led up to the rise of Hitler, World War II, all of those things. But I think he can learn those another way, and I don't want him watching this movie to learn that lesson. I can, I can teach him that through different means. This violates our religious beliefs. Well, the teacher made the right choice. The teacher said, fine. You can opt out. And that goes back to the same principle that we were talking about here under free exercise. If a student comes in and says, what you're teaching is going, you know, the act of sitting in this room is going to violate my religious beliefs I want out, generally speaking, unless a school can provide a compelling interest as to why not, the teacher should allow the student to opt out of that lesson, come back the next day penalty free. That's really important, okay? They can't, the teachers cannot penalize a student for saying, I don't want to watch this movie, it violates my religious beliefs. It doesn't matter that the 
teacher disagrees with the mom's philosophy in the Schindler's List example. It, it actually is not my personal belief of what she expressed there, but it's her personal belief, and to the extent schools can accommodate it, they need to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you want him to use it or want me to repeat it? I, I made a mistake too. They're recording this and they want people to questions to be able to come through the microphone. So if I call on you, let's wait and we'll let Justin sprint over to you with the mic. So Thanks. go ahead. In terms of uh, uh, talking about penalties, if in this uh, scenario the, uh, the teacher said, okay, instead of watching Schindler's List, we want you to read this book and, and uh, write a report on it. Is that considered a penalty since it's different from what all the class members, other class members have to do? I would characterize that as an accommodation. And that's generally the way the law works. Someone comes in and says, this burdens my religious free exercise. The teacher should say, fine, you can opt out. I still want you to learn about the Holocaust. And I think most people would agree that's a good goal. And so the teacher could work with the family to come up with a plan so that student could still learn about the Holocaust and still be graded, which is an important part of it. So no, I wouldn't think that would be a penalty. If the teacher stomped his foot and said, look, you watch this movie, I'm giving you a D. That's a penalty, right? And that's a burden on the free exercise of religion that the law doesn't allow. Okay. Yes. Right in front of you there. And then I saw another hand over here. Okay. Uh, how about a student who provides a religiously based answer on a test rather than what was taught in the class? Okay, so that's a good question. And it goes to another slide right here, student on student coercion. And so the, the answer is a little bit nuanced. And the example I'll give is this. If a if a teacher gives an assignment where students are supposed to get up and teach about the difference between, say, communism, socialism, and, and capitalism, that's the assignment. And one student gets up and instead of talking about that topic at all, just starts lecturing about why everyone in the room needs to repent and they need to believe in some form of religion or another and you know they're awful for not doing it and they should come to church with him, that student's rights have kind of stopped at that point because the student is in a position where the student can coerce other students and the teacher would be well within the teacher's rights to say, look, that's not the assignment, you need to sit down. Now, same scenario. They're supposed to get up and talk about communism, uh, socialism, and capitalism. And the student gets up and says, well, I want to talk about these three economic systems, but I want to do it from a religious viewpoint. And I want to talk about, you know, as a Christian, how I think these things should work. And they get into it, the, and they're, they're on topic, but they're just sharing it from their viewpoint. That is allowed, and that should be allowed. Now, if they're way off topic and their answers are completely off base, and they didn't talk on anything that that has to do with these principles that they've been studying in the class, a teacher might give them a bad grade for those reasons. But the teacher should not penalize them from speaking about it from a religious viewpoint. In your example of a written assignment, right? You're not dealing with student-on-student -student coercion. That's an that's an assignment handed to the teacher. The teacher really should be grading it on whether or not the student is analyzing whatever they were supposed to analyze you know, uh, in an intelligent way, using the stuff that they've learned about in class. The fact that the student uses a religious viewpoint to add to it should not result in any penalizing whatsoever. And that, that is not just a religious freedom standpoint, it's also a free speech matter. So students are allowed to do that and shouldn't be restricted. Now, in practicality, I mean, you're going to have a hard time proving that a teacher penalized someone because they added a religious viewpoint to something. Nevertheless, they shouldn't be doing that under the law. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, hold on one second. I think we had a hand over here. Right, these two ladies in the front in the blue shirt. And then we can come over here, and then there's one in the back. Uh, in the Utah... Uh, in Utah, at one time, they, they had been discussing on the radio sex, I mean the actual participation in sex and everything, and it was very, very, very offensive to some of our students to go there to have to uh, and listen to that. that do, they have, is the, do they have the right just to get up and walk out? The students? Uh-huh. Yes, they do. But they don't know that, I don't think. They'll go back and tell them. <laughs> I mean, that's what this is for, is so you guys can be educated and can go back and inform the students in your lives, in your churches, and in your families of what their rights are. 
they can rock. They don't have to sit there and listen to that. Yeah, and they, they can do it respectfully. They can stand up and tell the teacher, look, this offends my religious beliefs. It violates my religion to sit here and listen to this. I'm going to go wait in the hall until it's done. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. No, the students absolutely have that right. Uh, over here now. And right behind you, Justin. And then there was someone in the back. What if a student feels a religious imperative to proselytize? What rights do they have? Okay, so student-on-student -student coercion, I'm glad you asked that question because it relates to the story I started out with about my own life, right? That girl in my school library was proselytizing to me. That's what she was doing. And she is well within her rights to do that. So the schools, the, the law is that schools can place time, manner, and time, manner, and place restrictions on student speech, but they've got to do it equally across all types of student speech. So you can't treat religious speech any different than you can talking about the NBA finals, okay? And so if students are allowed between classes to gather in the hallways and chat and goof around and talk about anything they want, then they're allowed to proselytize to each other as well. And um, that is, the, the, the schools are not allowed to prohibit just that. Now you could have a school that says, look, we don't want you people talking at all. You get out of your class, you walk in silence to the next room, and you sit down. They'd be treating everyone the same. I don't know if that would actually stand up to constitutional muster if it went to a court. I also don't know if you could ever enforce something like that with a bunch of teenagers. Uh, it'd be fun to see them try. Um, but as long as they're treating everyone the same, then it's allowed. So, so the simple answer is yes, absolutely, students are allowed to proselytize, but they have to do it within the same and place restrictions as other forms of speech. Now that said, Schools do not have to authorize students to be able to coerce other students. Coercion is a, you know, it's a word, how do you define it? There's a definition problem with it, um, and I'll talk more about that in a little while. But this is a good example. If a teacher saw a group of students hovered around one student, telling him that he is going to burn in fiery damnation forever and he needs to come to church with them or else, and this kid is clearly being forced into this position, a teacher would be well within his or her rights to come up and tell these students you can't do that, okay? But finding, the, finding where that line is between proselyting, just good faith proselytizing and coercion, there can be gray areas, right? Um, generally speaking though, it happens, it happens in America's schools all across the country every single school day, and it's fine, and it, it's perfectly fine, okay? Way in the back over there. If, if the institute's having a dance or like free food, can I tell my students at a public university there's free food and a dance? You can go over to there if you want. You are at a university, not a K through 12 public school? Yeah. That's probably fine. I will tell you the law as to higher education is very different from the law as to K through 12. Um, and the difference is because courts have generally taken the position that K through 12 students are much more impressionable right. than college students. Um, I don't want to tell you this definitively, but I, I think you'd be fine at a public university to do that. Taking it to the high school level, uh, I, there, you would be hard pressed. I think you'd have a hard time getting away with that. And I'll talk more about why in a little bit. Okay, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, they didn't hear your question. He asked oh, at a university, he teaches at a university, and let's say a church is having a dance or something, uh, or some other church activity. Can he, as a professor uh, at a university, public university, tell students about this church activity that's going on and invite them to it? That was his question. So the law gets very different at universities just because the, the thought process there is these students are now older, they can handle these things much more better on their own. Most college students are likely to blow off their professors anyway. So, you know, whereas, <laughs> whereas teenagers are much more impressionable and, and may follow teachers uh, to places they shouldn't necessarily go. Did we have another hand up right here in the front? Sorry to make you run around so much, man. I have a question about what recourse do parents have if their child, and this happened to me, is graded down because I wouldn't let him read a book that was full of violence and, and profanity. and. He did extra reports and interviewed Vietnam, Vietnamese returned soldiers. He still didn't get the A he deserved. So I'm going to go down here to this slide, which is 
Parents absolutely have the right to go to the school board and advocate for what they know is the, the rights of their students and the law. And I would, if I were you, so there's pamphlets somewhere. I think they've already talked about on these pamphlets that have been produced. They're in the, each of you have them there. I would take pamphlets like that. I would go to the school board and to the principal or whoever you need to and let them know what the law is and tell them what your rights are and talk to them about this and make sure they understand it. And this actually happened where I, where my kids are going to school and one parent, not me, another parent went in and talked to the principal and the principal really cracked down on that teacher. And they had, a, they had a case very similar to yours where they could make incredibly strong arguments that their student had done far more than the rest of the class to learn about this particular topic. And the teacher, it was pretty clear the teacher was penalizing them simply because they had opted out of reading certain books, okay? Um, so I really want to emphasize this. As parents, you absolutely not only have the right, in my view, you have the duty to go and advocate for these things, to go talk to the principals. You can do it in a respectful way. You can do it without being antagonistic. But as you understand the law, you should be comfortable going in and telling them, my student has a right to opt out of these lessons and you can't penalize them for it. And absolute worst case scenario, these cases will get to litigation. Litigation is not fun for anybody, but sometimes it's the only way that these changes happen. Um, and it's, it can, I will tell you this as a litigator, you can get a long way with just letting somebody know that you're willing to litigate because they don't want to deal with that. More often than not, if a, if a parent comes in like that, the next phone call comes to me. What do we do? And that's why I say, well, you've got to tell this teacher to back off and, and accommodate what this student's trying to do. And then they'll go back and knock some heads together. Does that make sense? And what happened there? And so he sided with the teacher is really what happened. So then so, it's up to you as to whether or not you want to keep escalating it. But you know your rights. You know you can escalate it if you want to, to threaten litigation or to go up to the school board, mm -hmm. go up higher. Mm -hmm. You can do that. It's just a question for you of how hard do you want to push it. Yeah. Um, it, it, I think, well, there were several of us, several parents went together and talked to the principal. He, he sympathized, but then the grades didn't go up like they should have. Yeah. And again, look, these cases are difficult because I'm sure the teacher says, well, he really didn't do very good work, right? The teacher will make up all sorts of excuses. And then it becomes he said, she said, and you have to figure out the facts. It gets very complicated. But I think the important thing is that parents and students know their rights and are going in and talking about them because it will keep these teachers on their toes going forward. And you, right, let's, let's get a... Just, yeah. I'm just noting that that in my own experience with that, it hasn't very been very often that parents go in and say, "This is my religious right to abstain from reading this," or, and so that using that framework gives power that otherwise isn't there. And quite frankly, I would start using terms that you've learned here today. I would say, "Look, the free exercise clause of the Constitution gives me the right." the religious freedom right to take my son or daughter out of this particular lesson. Then they're like, whoa, this lady knows what she's talking about, right? <laughs> the, the free exercise clause of the Constitution. And the reason I say that is we live in a society where people like to pull out the word Constitution anytime they want something, right? Well, the Constitution says I can do this. Well, not really. They're just using the word Constitution. If you start zeroing in on specific clauses and telling people this is the law, um, they'll be more inclined to listen to you. There's a whole bunch of hands popping up everywhere here. Let's do her in the front and we'll come back to you, okay? In reference to the question that we just asked, um, also uh, under law districts are required to have what they call an educational equity specialist or a monitoring officer dealing with any type of discrimination. So um, I'm, I'm the monitoring officer for my school district, and I actually had a case dealing with religion based on these things that are going on right now. Um, and the parent did go to the teacher and then escalated to the, the principal, and then it was escalated at the district level. Our goal is to make sure it stays at that level and not go to litigation, and that's the main job of a monitoring officer within the school district. So in the event that the teacher or the principal, um, if you feel that th that that situation has not been handled, you can go specifically to a person in charge of discrimination at the district level, and they have to, by law, open a case and follow through with that case with the intended outcome being something that is uh, amenable to both the parent, the student, and 
the school or the district, depending on what it is. And if, if you, one word she just said, she said, our goal is to avoid litigation. They don't want to get into fights. Somewhere, someone in every school district wants to find a way to resolve these things the right way, right? And you don't want to get in fights either. Nobody does. But when you have a teacher that's just absolutely refusing to recognize your rights, then you have to find other avenues. So I'm glad. Thank you so much for that. We're there, and then we'll come up to the front. Thank you. I, I promise I won't keep asking questions and let you get to your to your topics. And no, things. That's okay. Um, I, I'm interested in the uh, idea of coercion on a more broad level. We've talked about it in the context of coercing religion upon other students, but what about uh, other forms of speech, other uh, uh, political ideals and values? It seems to me that the tide is sort of shifting away from uh, religious coercion onto others than uh, having other um, values being coerced on the on the religious people who, who, who don't agree with them. Is there any sort of uh, obligation to, to teachers and schools to, to uh, stop that from happening? Yes, uh, and that's actually two slides away. So well, can we just hold it for just a second and we'll come back to that. Um, and then let's do this question and then I'll move on in the slides. If I don't get to it, remind me, like wave your hands. As in the case of this woman over here, we don't know what these laws are, and so what would you say would be the best way to get the public informed about all these things? Do we do a mass mailing? What do we do? Um, I think anymore you're looking, it's gotta be social media and electronic means. I'm not sure a mass mailing is gonna get you anywhere, you know, nowadays. But things like this, these pamphlets that have been given to you guys, parents' rights and teachers' rights, there are electronic versions of those as well, and you can get those and you can post them to Facebook or, or tweet them out, links to them, and you can spread the word that way. But I think attending conferences like this and then going back to your communities and sharing what you learn is the best way to get that out there. I, it's absolutely crucial, though. I think you've raised the great problem, which is many students and parents don't know what their rights are. And they read one misinformed news article or broadcast and they get terrified and they're not sure what they can do and, and they need to they need to take the time to understand their rights and I would say be vocal about what those rights are without being combative. Um, I talked about student on student coercion I just want to emphasize so you are allowed to exercise your rights your free exercise of religion rights up to the point that you are then infringing on other people's rights okay so students can't bully other people into, into their religion. or th That's kind of the idea that we're getting at there, okay? Um, schools have the right to stop somebody from doing that. That's different from proselytizing. They don't have the right to stop proselytizing. Now, I want to move into the Establishment Clause part of this. So remember, we talked about free exercise clause principles. That's what we just discussed. Now we're going to move into the Establishment Clause principles. And what I want to talk about is how schools need to treat um, students and parents. This starts to get into your question, okay? There is something that uh, applies, is, it comes from both the Establishment Clause of the Constitution and it comes from, the statute, from a statute called the Equal Access Act that essentially says schools have to treat all groups equally, okay? This is true among religious groups, so it has to treat the Protestant student group the same as it does the Mormon student group. It's also true though when you talk about religion versus non-religion. So if you have the um, American Humanist Association wants to start a student group, the school needs to treat it, that group the exact same way it would a Christian student group. If a group calling itself, you know, Students for Satan wants to start a chapter in the school, unless that group is going to do something like kill people or cause harm, you have to treat it, schools need to treat it the exact same way they would any other group, okay? Where they can stop it, of course, is if a group is going to cause some kind of harm or disturbance in that sense. But if they just want to have a student group, they have to treat all the student groups the same. That's really, really important, and it's a major source of litigation. I was just talking, again, to another friend of mine who's dealing with a case where one student group, it was a Christian student group, went around gathering cans uh, and did a food drive so they could take all this food down to Guatemala and give it to poor people. Sounds fine. The only problem is, is part, of the, part of the giving of the cans, they also included Bibles with it and did some preaching down in Guatemala. So the question became, well, Jesus, the school now supporting this group in their proselytizing efforts in Guatemala. They were sued by another student group, the American Humanist Association, um, saying, well, you didn't give us that kind of support for what we're doing, you know, and that's a violation of this, and that's being litigated right now. 
uh, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to navigate it. The important thing, though, from that perspective is that you have to treat everyone the same. Religious, non-religious, among religions, you have to treat them the same. Uh, okay. You know, if, if you don't know what's going to be discussed, it's kind of hard to control it, isn't it? At schools, you mean? Uh-huh. That I mean, is a problem. Um, I mean, that is a big problem because they don't say, well, tomorrow we're going to discuss this. Some teachers do, but you're right. A lot don't. A or, lot don't. So what, what's your position? Then I think students need to be educated as to what their rights are. Parents need to teach their students what their rights are. And it's hard for students. There's no question about it. But you never, you never would think that some of these things would even come up. Well, that's why I'm giving you the broad principles. You can teach a student and say, look, if, someone is, if something is happening at school that is infringing on your religious beliefs, you have the right to do something about it. And let them know that. And then teach them how to do it in a respectful way. And I think, I think students can do that. And, and they're willing to do it if they understand it. But lots of times they don't know what their rights are. There's a lot of peer pressure, and they're afraid. So I think it is very much important to teach them their rights. But you're right. There's no way you can predict everything that's going to happen in any given school with all these different teachers and all their different beliefs. Things pop up all the time, and it's very difficult to, to prepare for every single scenario. But if you understand the broad principles, I think you can at least be ready for it. Mm -hmm. I want to Let me move on to this a little bit here. There's a difference between coercion and endorsement. And uh, this hopefully will get to your question, but if I don't, let me know. Schools are not allowed to coerce students into a particular form of religious belief or non-belief. Okay? So what would coercion be? Coercion would be things like penalizing a student because they have the wrong religious beliefs. Okay? It would be a teacher, this was a case that actually got litigated all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, It'd be a case where a teacher is in the classroom and insists on preaching to the kids from the Bible as the teacher in the classroom every day. Okay, that happened in Texas. You had a, um, a Baptist teacher in a mostly Baptist school district, and every day the teacher would come in and they would read in the Bible from a Baptist viewpoint and then teach these kids um, kind of Baptist theology. And a Mormon student and a Catholic student sued and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, you can't do that. A teacher can't have a confined audience that they can punish who can't get away and then push their religion on them or push their non-religion on them. Okay? You can't turn to the Christian kid who believes in creation and say, you're a fool for believing in creation. Your job is to get up there and teach the science, not to comment on someone's religious beliefs. Okay? So you can't use your authoritative figurehead power to coerce students. Endorsement... This is my coer oh, sorry. This is my coercion picture of the, the guy here berating the small child. Endorsement's a little bit different, and this is where it gets really squishy. Everybody gets it and understands that schools can't coerce students. But there's a question about whether or not a school can endorse a religious message or a non-religious message. And then there's a question of at what point are you actually endorsing? That is a very squishy line that you can't always tell, okay? Generally speaking, the law is schools can't endorse a message one way or the other. They need to stay neutral. Where the law gets really messy is trying to figure out have they really done that or not. Okay? In my example of the school group gathering cans and going down to Guatemala and giving out Bibles, a big part of the lawsuit is this question of how much help did the school give them? How much did the school know about what they were going to do? Did the school, was the school aware that they were going to go down there and, and preach and give out Bibles in Guatemala? And if so, was the school endorsing that religious message? If so, there could be a violation of the Constitution there. Okay? The important thing to know, though, is that for your students and for your purposes, teachers and principals and administrators have to come up with policies and, and plans in their classrooms where they're staying as neutral as possible, and they're not pushing one view or the other. So I'll give the same example. You can teach about science, and that's wonderful, but you can't then comment to students about whether their religious beliefs are inappropriate or not. That's where you cross the line into endorsing a message. Okay, does that make sense? Question?
where is the law now with regard to the valedictorian giving a religious um, sp uh, message as part of his valedictory? So all of this kind of fits together. Um, if the valedictorian gets up, it's their speech, it's his or her speech. School had nothing to do with it. They don't know what he or, he or she's going to talk about. And he, decides to, he or she decides to get into religious topics and everything else. It is totally of his own volition. Most courts will allow that. It's mixed because there is this feeling of, okay, that's totally student-led and student-initiated, so school had nothing to do with it. There's no endorsement. That, where courts will sometimes rule against the valedictorian is this question here. Is the student getting up and he has a captive audience and is using that opportunity to preach at a government function? And some courts might rule against the student there. So you get kind of a mixed result in the courts on that particular question. But as to endorsement, if it's totally student initiated, it's not a problem. Now there are circumstances where students get up and give prayers or sermons and the schools have been involved in helping that happen and that would be considered a violation. Does that make sense? Okay, yes, right here. Hold on, yeah. What if the school district has to approve the speech and they say you have religion there? Can they say, well, you have to take it out because now we know? That can happen, yes, generally speaking. If they're approving the speech and they're involved in writing the speech, what I generally advise school districts is like, just stay out of it, man. Let these students do their thing. This person's valedictorian for a reason, they're probably gonna be just fine. And they might criticize the school like that kid in Wyoming did. Well, let them criticize the school, right? It's not a big deal. Um, right here, oh, actually, can we get right in the back behind, yeah. Uh, as a so as a LDS teacher in a, in a school that has very few LDS students, my students know that I'm LDS because I have a BYU uh, banner thing, um, and so sometimes I get I get questions about my religion as in front of the whole class, um, and then other students I've had other students come and say she can't answer that. Um, what are the boundaries there? You should definitely go take the other class on teacher rights. Uh, the boundaries are, you should be nervous. I mean, you know, like you want to you answer the question. Some teachers will just say, look, I don't, I, I'm not going to discuss that here. Um, you, you know, we can talk to you later or after you graduate <laughs> or when you're not in my class and I don't have any authority over you. Um, some teachers will just answer the question very succinctly. Some teachers will wait and do it in private where they don't, they're not using the entire classroom as an audience. But in all honesty, you do need to be somewhat careful with how you handle that because you may just be answering one question and there may be someone over here who feels like you're preaching to them and you, you know they're afraid to say anything and suddenly you're infringing on their rights. And so you have to just be careful as a teacher and recognize the authority position you're in. Does that make sense? Yes, right here. So comprehensive sex ed is pretty hot topic through the nation. If a district creates a policy in favor of comprehensive sex ed, which essentially teaches anything, and which would go against a lot of people's religion or their moral. I mean, that seems like an endorsement, you know, and, and especially if they have, you know, you talked about the opt-in, opt-out, where legislatures are trying to have everything an opt-in policy. That's not to say that parents can't opt their children out of these comprehensive sex ed, but it makes it more difficult and parents are not as aware. So I guess, so when, it, when policy is made on a district level supporting comprehensive sex ed, I mean, is, would you consider that one of these squishy areas? Because it's a lot of what they say of, of this new gender diverse or will a gender diversity, which is you, would, you can identify sexually however you want and your orientation can be however you want. That's not good science, you know what I mean? So I'll just stop and let you. Yeah, well, I mean, it's all debated, right? It's debated whether or not it's good science, it's debated whether or not that teaching those views it's an endorsement of a religious message or not. I mean, you are, you are raising the questions that are being litigated right now and they're trying to be decided, and courts are trying to figure out. But this is something that is constantly debated. Is something just science or is it religion? And, and at what point does it cross the line into religion? And, and you've hit on something that's kind of in a gray area that courts are still trying to navigate. As a parent though, I think you do have to take advantage of the, the, the right to pull your children out um, of the lessons that you don't think are right for them uh, or that violate your religious beliefs. 
and at the same time advocate for other types of teachings. A certain number of weeks, and it's usually an all or a nothing. If you dispute some of it, then the kid is taken out of all of it. Anyway, it's... It's not easy. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend it's easy. It can be very complicated. I see other hands, and I'm sorry, but I want to move on to one last video. We may have time for a couple more questions at the end. Um, holidays, by the way, just real quickly, students celebrate holidays however they want to. Okay. Again, it can't get to the point where they are coercing other students. Schools, however, have to be careful about how they handle holidays. They can't endorse one holiday over another. It's the same principles that I've already been trying to, to teach. They can't endorse Christmas over Hanukkah. Okay? They, they have to be very careful about how they handle that. But they can teach about holidays, and they can teach about religion. What they can't do is get to the point where they are endorsing one viewpoint over another. Does that make sense? So uh, I'm going to skip this one because we are a little bit short on time. And I want to give an example that I think touches on everything here. Hopefully this video will work. Let's go, Nate! Never before have there been so many people sitting in the stands during a Bremerton High School football game. And never before have there been so many cameras, news crews from across Western Washington and across the country here not to cover the game. Instead, they're here to talk to the coach who's been sidelined by the school district. Joe Kennedy was put on paid leave on Wednesday because of his decision to continue praying after each game, despite district orders to stop. I'm willing to take this as far as they go to defend the rights of the Constitution, you know, Till the end. If it comes back one way or another, I, I fought the good fight. In the larger than usual crowd at this game, almost everyone expressed support for Kennedy. A few parents seem frustrated that the controversy is taking attention away from the players on what was supposed to be Bremerton Senior Night. It should have never came to this. And in the fourth quarter came the arrival of a group from the Satanic Temple of Seattle who said they showed up at the request of several students and teachers who wanted their beliefs represented as well. We literally, we just wanted to meet the students who invited us out here and show that we support them in doing that. But we'll leave peaceably if they want us to. But they left before the end of the game and before Coach Kennedy knelt down in front of his seat in the bleachers, bowed his head and prayed. Amen. Amen. And Coach Kennedy and his attorneys have said they feel his right to religious freedom is being violated. And so they are moving forward with legal action against the school district. We should also mention amidst all the off the field drama that Bremerton High School won this football game tonight, which means they are now headed to the playoffs. And Coach Kennedy told me after the game that he has never been more proud of this team. So that, that's a live controversy right now. That report was just from a few days ago. Um, you can see it all being played out right there, right? What are the rights of this coach versus the rights of the students? If the coach is getting down and making his team join him, is he coercing those who don't believe in God to engage in a religious act that they don't want to engage in, right? Um, on the other hand, what about those Christian players who do want to pray with them? What rights should they have? It, all of this kind of comes together with the principles we've been talking about. So I'd be curious to know, based on what we've talked about today, how would you view that scenario? I want to be very clear. These cases, the, the specificity of the facts is really important. This is one where the coach is leading the prayers with the team around him in the middle of the field. Applying what we've talked about today, how would you handle that if you were a judge? Let's wait till we get the mic to you. If one of the players said, I'd like to opt out, he should be able to opt out then. Okay. All right, so a player should be able to opt out. Okay, here we have a hand. Uh, those players who would like to pray after the game are welcome to assemble together and, to, and, and one of the students pray on behalf of all of them. I guess whether the coach can join in might be a question, but uh, uh, I can see no reason why the student shouldn't be able to assemble in prayer and pray on their own. So let's, let me stop there and say, and we'll go, there was a hand in the back we'll go to, to respond to that, you're absolutely right. So the students can go, if it's student-led, student-initiated, student-run, they can go and pray as much as they want to. It's the coach's involvement that's the problem here, right? 
or that's raising the ire of everybody. It appears as though you have an endorsement, certainly, I think, and it could potentially be argued coercion um, if he's ordering these players to join him in prayer. Now, we don't know from that little clip I showed you whether he's ordering them or not. That's all stuff a judge has to figure out. So the question is, can the coach join these students if they're running prayers, and is that an endorsement? We have someone in the back. I was just going to say that even if the coach isn't ordering them to pray, the idea that the coach is leading them in prayer, they may feel that if they don't participate, they're somehow missing out or they're disadvantaged, and that can cause a problem. So if it was a student-led, it would be different, but where the coach is leading it, um, high school sports, it, there's so much politics involved in it that they may feel if they aren't participating in it, then they are disadvantaged. And, and what happens when the atheist student in the group goes to the principal and says, the coach isn't playing me, because I won't pray with them. I'm an atheist, right? The same principle applies there as it does to the kid who doesn't want to be involved in watching a video that violates his religious beliefs. You've got to apply it both ways. So that, that's a good point. Okay, in the back. I wonder if it makes a difference if the coach started praying on his own over on the sideline and then students over the months started joining him, like, hey, can I join with you? I mean, to me, it seems pretty clear that this is, under our current jurisprudence, has crossed the line into unauthorized endorsement of some sort of religion. But could I ask one other question? You, you said that teachers answering whether they're Christian or Muslim or Jewish is a, is a tricky area, so you want to be careful. But I've never heard of any precedence that says you cannot answer the question regarding your religion. Have you heard of anything like that where if a student says, are you Jewish? Yeah, I'm Jewish. Oh, no, no. I don't think that would be a violation. So I think the, so the lady is, could say, yeah, I'm LDS and just leave it at that, right? For absolutely. Sure. I, I took her question to mean uh, if someone asks you Mormon, yes. Well, what do Mormons believe about Jesus? And suddenly you're up there for 45 minutes talking about whatever Mormons believe about Jesus and other students in the room feel like they're being lectured. That's where you start to cross the line. Okay, what other thoughts on this? School prayer case. Any other thoughts? Yes, right up here. Hold on, real quick. When you were being really careful, when you were being really careful, or having her act really careful with her hat as a teacher, coaches have a double whammy. They're teachers. I mean, that's a lot of authority that broods over. And this was a non-religious situation, but I had a son. We had a daughter getting married, and he still. Um, punished him for being gone to that marriage of his sister. So coaches, I don't know, I think that's, he's probably crossed the line that he should have been wise in allowing that to go to a student-led thing because there's just too much assumed and unassumed authority of what a coach can do. Right. I mean, I was terrified of my high school coach, <laughs> quite frankly. Now I look back and I'm like, why was I so afraid of that man? But at the time, I was. So that's a good point. And he certainly would have been well within his rights to just say, look, I am staying out of this. You as a team can decide what you want to do, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not taking one side or the other. I'm not going <laughs> to endorse one side or the other. You as students need to decide how you want to handle your post-game activities. And that's fine, right? Yeah. Joining with them is what's causing the controversy. I am sorry. We are out of time. I'm happy if anyone wants to come up after and talk some more. I want to give... Um, this last slide here of what freedom looks like in America's schools and go back to my own experience. So when this other student in the library asked me if I wanted to go to church with her, started giving me church leader, uh, literature, and then other students from other religions came and started trying to talk me out of going to church with her and out of reading her stuff that she was giving to me. And there was this great lively debate. And at one point we were in a class with a teacher there and all of these different religious factions were all arguing, and I was in the middle trying to decide which way my life was going to go, and the teacher never said a word. He just sat there smiling. That's what freedom looks like in the schools. He didn't use his authoritative power to weigh down the scale for either side. The students were allowed to engage in lively theological debates and allow me to learn about a lot of different religions. I ended up picking one. It's my faith today. It's changed my life. It's the reason I have my, the family I have, married my wife, all of these things. But it's because we allowed freedom of religion in schools 
We allowed students to proselytize and teach each other without teachers or schools getting involved and punishing anybody. And, and it was a wonderful experience. And I hope that you will go back into your communities and help students, teachers, parents, and administrators understand these principles. Thank you.